Hello. Um, everyone's doing some quite serious talks, and I'm just going to do this gimmick, which is <laughs> time travelling. But we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm Steve. I'm a product manager on Gov.uk. Um, that means I sort of look after multidisciplinary teams of developers, designers, user researchers, um, all to pr try and provide value for uh, the public, essentially. Um, does anyone know what Gov.uk is? What's the hazard, like a chance of trying to describe it? Someone? That's fine, I'll do it for you. Um, but I'm going to start off with this caveat, which is um, I spent a lot of my teenage years in my bedroom playing around with websites and not really talking to many people, unless they were at, like, on forums or something, um, but really just playing with HTML and CSS and uploading stuff. Um, and it was just wild and fun and getting into those rabbit holes of the web, you know, just like going onto a web page, following a link and going and going and going and just like learning stuff and gathering so much information to me was incredible and that's why I think the web is beautiful. I hope a lot of you here still feel that too because you're at Mozilla Festival, I'm sure you do. Um, but that's also the caveat to this talk uh, and why I'm using a gimmick really. Um, so what is gov.uk? Since you don't know, I'm going to explain. <laughs> Um, but basically, Gov.uk is the UK government's home on the web. It's the best place to find government services and information, um, and it makes it simpler, clearer, and faster to interact with government. Um, so previously, government had been like hundreds of websites all across the web, um, but by creating this single domain, um, the public has a consistent experience of interacting with government, so they can come along, do a thing, like renew their tax disc, and then just get on with their lives. Um, but it didn't just come out of nowhere, there's a bit of history to that. Um, so in 2005 there was a transformational government report which said that the future of public services has to use technology to give citizens choice with personalised services designed around their needs, not the needs of the provider. And that's what we mean by start with user needs, it's really look at the people you're trying to serve, work out what their problems are and design around those, rather than the needs of government who say we want to do this because we think it's a good idea. It's all about getting the evidence to really uh, solve the problem for people. Then in 2010, um, this lady, Martha Lane Fox, recommended that government joins the, what she described as, the wave of ine inevitability. I can never say that. The wave of inevitability, uh, and she wrote a report called Revolution, Not Evolution. Um, and she commented on how government could use the internet both to communicate and interact better with citizens and to deliver significant efficiency savings from channel shift. Um, so initially it was about the idea of you put stuff on the web, you don't have to have as many call centres, but I think after seven years of the GDS project we are learning that actually it's a bit wider than that, we have end-to-end -end services. Um, but that report basically spurred um, a big change and got a lot of change to happen within government. It created Government Digital Service uh, and Gov.uk itself. Um, and it basically set this proposition that by better understanding how users interact with government, we can better design government and how it serves people. So you've already seen some of the design principles so far, um, but design principles and standards were sort of essential to making sure that Gov.uk was cons as consistent and accessible as possible. Um, so those are the design principles. These are sort of guidelines that help service teams um, design a service for government. Um, they're not strict rules, they're sort of things that you keep in the back of your mind when you're actually designing something, um, but they are described in uh, quite some detail. Um, so start with user needs seems like a really simple phrase and you're like, yeah, that's obvious, but actually underneath that is um, you having to set up weeks and weeks, or you know, two to three weeks of a discovery to really understand the problem that people are going through so that you can better design for it. Um, so it just goes to show there's quite a lot of heavy design baked into how we do things. Um, we also have this, which is the service manual, which tells service teams um, when they come up against a particular problem, how they can go and solve that. Um, so the service standard is basically like an assessment that service teams go through um, to check how they are meeting um, some of the requirements that we set out for digital public services to be good and to meet users' needs. Um, the service manual helps people, if they're not too familiar with some of those practices, actually learn how to do that. Um, 
And then internally at Government Digital Service, we have this, which is the GDS way, and this helps our development teams um, build software in a consistent way, in a scalable way, um, and without too much problem. Getting on to the standards side of things, um, this is the style guide for online hypertext that was developed by Tim Berners-Lee in the early 90s, just after the World Wide Web was invented. Um, and it sets out how you should be creating websites um, and making them work and, and ensuring that everyone has a good experience when using those. It has been iterated over time, as you can see. Um, but what was good for me as a bit of an evangelist when I joined Gov.uk was that some of these rules uh, and standards were sort of, sorry, standards, not rules. Some of these standards were baked into the way that we do, um, or the way that we release software on Gov.uk. Um, so there's one which is called Cool Your Eyes Don't Change, uh, which basically means if you go to a page and see a 404, really that should redirect you to the new page or something like that. Um, we have these crazy redirection rules all over our platform uh, that means you should never hit a broken link um, unless you just typed in something incorrectly. Um, knowing that that was baked in just filled me with joy when I started working there. It sounded like an advert, but yes, you should work for government. Anyway. Um, so these are the, the main body of those web standards, and it's that web technologies should be interoperable, web standards should be open, i.e. non-proprietary, and the web should be accessible to all. Um, those are really at the heart of the World Wide Web itself. Um, you know, it was invented because people were creating documents um, in, for research in universities and people wanted to be able to share those, but you need particular software in order to uh, access those documents and to read them. So HTTP was invented, which gave birth to the World Wide Web and meant that as long as you could dial into someone's computer, you could read their document. And this is how we take some of those standards through into building gov.uk. So the first one is that we start with HTML. Um, we start with HTML because it's very heavily standardized. It's uh, one of the earliest like, web languages, I suppose. Um, and it gives good semantic structure for how you should um, structure your pages and allow those to be read by web browsers, by um, voice assistants, by accessibility equipment, by anything. Um, so the, the one thing that I want to pull out is that bit, um, HTML is the most resilient layer. If the HTML fails, there's no web page, so the CSS, so should the CSS or JavaScript fail, the HTML will still render correctly. Um, we have a kind of rule which is um, you should always make it work through the HTML, not the JavaScript, which is just you know really baking web standards heavily into the design of gov.uk. So we're going to get onto the time traveling gimmick now. Um, so gov.uk was built on web standards, and the proof of that is that you can time travel from 2019 to 1989 and actually see what 2019 looks like in 1989. Uh, I am using the very first web browser, World Wide Web, which was developed at CERN uh, in 1989 to do that. It was recently relaunched, um, so you can go and access that and feel, see what it was like to browse the web in 1989. Um, but first, if I just show you what gov.uk looks like today. So this is the home page. You sort of go along to some of our navigation. You have these, what they're called Miller columns, and you can go through to some guidance about disability premiums. And you can see it's pretty heavily stylized so that it's readable and accessible. So through a modern web browser, it looks like there's been quite a lot of work gone into it, and there's loads of bells and whistles and stuff. But if you travel back to 1989, you might think that actually you couldn't really view it, it would just appear as nothing. Uh, but because we've used, kept web standards close to our heart, you can actually see it. So this is what it looks like, the very first web browser. It's terrible to use. It's a good job they've made it better. So I'm just going to visit the home page now. And that's what the home page looks like. It's not as wonderfully stylized, but all the information is there. You can click through to business and self-employment and go through to a step-by-step, -step, which tells you how to set yourself up as a self-employed person. 
Be we can do that because um, everything is built in HTML and sticks with those web standards so that it's all identifiable and referenceable. Um, next, I use one of the most wonderful bits of boring magic on gov.uk, which is the random page generator. So that's gov.uk slash random, play around with it, it was fun. Um, so we've got to this using Bayesian decision analysis to help achieve a precautionary approach, whatever that is. And you can see that if we go and follow a link from that page, this page doesn't work without cookies, which isn't a good web standard. Um, things should be available and operational without needing to use complex technologies. Um, and that's the thing with gov.uk, is like anyone may need to access gov.uk and its information from anywhere. Um, so you want to make sure that can be represented on whatever device that they're using. Another random page, we found a PDF. Um, so let's see what a PDF looks like in 1989. <laughs> it's gibberish, absolutely terrible. Um, because of that, we have a bit of a rule that we would prefer that um, content on the web on gov.uk should be published in HTML and not PDF so that anyone can access it and so that they don't need to have particular software in order to understand how to do something. Because largely, that's what people come to gov.uk for. They just want to come along, do something, and then get on with their life. Um, we were doing some user research this week and we were sort of asking people, like, what do you think government is? Um, and they were all saying that um, as soon as we ask the question, they start thinking about politicians. Um, but then when they look at the website, they think about all the services that they can offer. And they were, someone was like, it's just this amorphous blob. I don't really know what happens and, and what, what it does. Um, and that's some of the design principles that have gone into gov.uk, is that people shouldn't have to understand those different levels of government and what they do. They should just be able to come along, do their thing, and get away. This is kind of why we need to um, change PDF into HTML across the website, and we're trying to do it, um, but people like their fancy designed PDFs. Um, but basically, compared with HTML content, information published in a PDF is harder to find, use, and maintain. More importantly, unless created with sufficient care, PDFs can often be bad for accessibility and rarely comply with open standards. And that's the point of the web standards. They're open, anyone can use them, and it means that anyone can have access to the information on gov.uk just to get on with their life. So I'm in a lot of chats with senior people in government at the moment, and they're all trying to think about how can we be the best, and how can we get somewhere else. And Estonia is always referenced as like, well, can't we just do the Estonia thing? That's amazing. And you have to go, Estonia's three million people. And the, the head of Estonia is like an ex-developer. So he just wants to transform it and make it technology driven. Um, so Estonia often gets viewed as like the internet nation of the future and the one thing that we should go for. So um, no offense to Estonia, but I thought I'd <laughs> figure out uh, how they are presented on uh, a web browser in 1989. And you kind of expect there'll be something. They are quite good. They are nice. I've spoken to them a bit. So I do feel bad doing it. <laughs> it's nothing. Um, most of their website is done in JavaScript, so just hardly anything renders in this web browser. Um, and when you think about how that translates to potentially someone uh, trying to access, access their website from like a phone that was made 10 years ago or something, you know, it's okay for someone to have a phone that's 10 years old. Why should they not be able to see their government's information uh, and get on with their lives just because they've got a 10-year-old phone? Um, so if you're interested in some of those standards and principles that we use day in, day out, you can look at the gov.uk service toolkit, which like groups together a whole bunch of stuff um, that we've already talked about today. There's a brand new one on there, which I would encourage everyone to use, which is um, a catalogue of a APIs in government. Um, there's a couple of gov.uk ones there, which are good to use. Um, our search API, which is getting a few more features on it soon. The content API, which allows you to consume our content and show it in anything else. So you could build another gov.uk if you wanted. That would be fine. Um, 
And there's also our registers which are in there, which is basically how does government describe countries and departments. You can just use those lists. You don't have to worry about having to create them yourselves. Um, also the GDS way, which I referenced earlier, that's how we do technology in GDS and release code. Um, it's quite good to sort of look at those principles and think about how they might apply at where you work and how you can change things, because it just saves a lot of hassle and gets rid of a lot of arguments if you're all just working in the same way. Also got the gov.uk developer documentation, so if you are interested in using some of our software or contributing to it, because it's all open, um, you can go in there, take a look through the code, see how it works, spin it up on your machine, and then submit PRs. And finally, yeah, just going to give a plug to the gov.uk blog. Um, this is where we talk about how we do product management um, on gov.uk. Um, that did get published yesterday, which is a, a framework I came up with to prioritize bugs. Look at it, it's enjoyable. You will enjoy it. Um, but there's other stuff in there about like, how we create roadmaps and um, how we deal with redesigning content. So um, recently, our content designers took some Brexit-related content, and they took it from like 1,600 words down to 300, and it gives you everything that you need to know. So you can follow some of our processes and ways of working that way. Thank you. <laughs>